What I want to talk now about is a bit about this Hamiltonian matrix. Now, if we do, if we include really all Slater determinants, which one can get from the set of molecular orbitals, I mean obviously in the actual calculation, your set of molecular orbitals is going to be a finite number, uh, and that gives you also a finite number of determinants, although that number is going to be rather large, uh, it's still finite. Um, and this approach where you have all determinants included, that is called full CI, full configuration interaction. And actually that is sort of the reference value for all other methods, because that is the, in quotes, exact solution to the Schrodinger equation within that given basis set. Because the only thing which then limits us is how large is your one electron basis set. So, so people for some time did these kind of full CI calculations for different systems with sort of as large a one electron basis that they can handle and that would sort of be really then the reference value and all other methods could compare with that because that's for the given basis set the exact solution. Now that matrix is very large, uh, we're going to look at, at it for a bit now. Um, <coughs> so we want to use all kinds of tricks in order to not have to calculate all that in a way also is going to apply for all the other methods afterwards. Um, and one of the, I guess I have four, four possibilities to reduce the number of matrix elements uh, we have to calculate. The first one is a bit in continuation of what we did on Tuesday is spin symmetry. I mean, we know we're trying to describe a particular state of our system, so we know what kind of spin that wave function should have, what kind of spin symmetry. Whether it should be a singlet state, a triplet state, if you have a radical, a doublet state, or whatever you want to try to describe. So if that, we know what the wave function, what kind of spin symmetry it should be, meaning what are the quantum numbers of the the spin quantum number, capital S, or even the MS quantum number, then obviously there's no reason to include any determinants here in the expansion which do not have the same spin symmetry. So we only want to include, if you're going for a signal state, we only want to include uh, determinants which also have S equals to zero and MS equals to zero. If it's a doublet, we only want to have uh, determinants which have s equal to one half. And that means we have to make sure that the determinants we use here are for the eigenfunction. Of not only MS, all determinants are eigenfunction of, of the set component of the spin operator, but they also should be eigenfunction of the s squared. And we did that on Tuesday as an example for a determinant which only has for two electrons. You could see there were sort of a linear combination for the alpha, beta, beta, alpha component for the m is equal to zero component. And correspondingly, one has to do that for all kinds of other determinants. Um, for the a set for, if you look at a single, uh, a single excited determinant, and let's assume that we have a few orbitals, four for example, and I moved the electron sitting in this occupied orbital to some other orbital like this. This would be a, a that's a single excited determinant. Um, then we found out in Tuesday that this is not an eigenfunction to a squared. But if you make a linear combination of this one, this configuration with the with that one and combine them with a minus sign. 
then we got something which is uh, again a singlet which has an s value equals to zero because this is alpha beta minus beta alpha and correspondingly if you would combine it with a plus sign you would get uh, the triplet state for a doublet double not doublet double excited determinant let's take the same again so if we would like to have something like some kind of double excited ones um, that's a singlet that's easy um, if you would go for this kind of double excited where you have um, what do I want to do uh, where I have something like this that's one possibility as far as I remember there are five more So we actually have there are five other possibilities how you can combine them. Um, so they are the higher the excitation level, the more possibilities there are to do that. Um, more than computer programs, of course, do that for you. You don't have to do that, uh, uh, but it has to be done because otherwise you're going to try to calculate matrix elements, which are going to be zero anyway. Then, so spin symmetry is one. Obviously, spatial symmetry, point group symmetry, group symmetry is another obvious um, way you can reduce the number of matrix elements which you want to calculate. And actually, this afternoon, when we're going to do calculations, um, you have to tell the program that. You have to tell the program in the input file what kind of spin symmetry you are aiming for. You also have to tell it the point group symmetry. Um, again, since I mean, I don't want to go deeper into that because not all of you had enough uh, symmetry background to, to discuss that in more detail. The other two options are then simply if you have some kind of a matrix element where, you, let's say we have the SDF determinant here, we have our Hamiltonian with the one and two electron terms, and we have a some kind I, J, K, whatever, A, B, C excited determinant. And this matrix element is not zero because of spin symmetry, it's also not zero because of point group symmetry. Then there are some rules called Slater Condor rules. Which tell you in how many orbitals the two determinants are allowed to differ in order for that matrix element to be different from zero. The point is the Hamiltonian has one electron operator, the kinetic energy, the electron nuclear attraction operator, that's a one electron operator, it's always, each term depends only of, on the coordinates of one electron, and then you have the electron-electron repulsion, Coulomb repulsion operator. That obviously depends on the coordinates of two electrons. But there's no term in the Hamiltonian which depends on three electrons. So you have one and two electron terms. Uh, and if you ever have tried to evaluate matrix elements over the terminals, uh, you might remember that it makes a difference what kind of operator you have and what the difference is in how of orbitals. I mean, if I take, for example, but let's take a single excited determinant. That single excited determinant means that it differs from the hard to fog determinant in the way that the occupied orbital E, I don't know, 2p orbital of some atom, well it's molecular orbital, so let's see, 
some sigma bond orbital was replaced by a virtual orbital, an orbital which is not included here. So a single excited determinant, as I said also on Tuesday, should be called a singly replaced determinant, meaning there is a difference in one orbital between those two determinants. Um, and if I have <coughs> to do ij, a, b, then there's a difference in two orbitals. And the slater conan rules then say that in order to be a matrix element over the Hamiltonian between two determinants to be different from zero, they are only allowed to differ in two orbitals. And the two orbitals is because there's a two electron operator in the Hamiltonian. If you only would have one electron operators, then they are not only allowed to define one. So we only can have a difference of two, which means SDF with the double excited determinant is going to give us something. A single excited determinant can give us something also with a triple excited determinant. So it's for to fog, it's single and double, single excited, it's going to be hard to fog, single, double and triple. So it's basically from what you have on one side, the other side can differ two up, two down. So if, if, if that would be a double excited here, then it could be hard to fog, single excited, double excited, triple excited, quadruple excited. And then we can sort of let that continue. So that's the Slater corner rules. Uh, no larger difference than two orbitals. That's sort of the quintessence. Um, and we're going to come back to that uh, also next week. When you look at malopressive perturbation theory and couple clusters, because there again, I mean, we always end up with this kind of matrix elements. And the question is, which ones actually are different from zero? And then finally, <coughs> there's one other thing, which is called the point Wayne theorem. Which tells us that if you have here the SDF, SDF self-consistent field or Hartree Fock determinant, and we have a single excited determinant, and the orbitals we use there are really the eigenfunctions to the Fock operator, so we solve, then this is actually zero. So that's it has nothing to do with that. It's not, it shouldn't be zero because of the slater corner rules. But there's some extra thing, because if one calculates that, then it happens to be one element of the Fock operator. Precisely the one with the two orbitals here. But when we did a hard to Fock calculation, a hard to Fock calculation is diagonalizing the Fock matrix. So if you have canonical orbitals which diagonalize the Fock matrix, then this off-diagonal element of the Fock matrix is zero. I mean, that's how we make the orbitals. We make sure that this matrix is diagonal. Or at least, actually the occupied-occupied part does not have to be diagonal if you use localized orbitals, so that we really can talk about sigma bonds and pi bonds and, uh, and all this picture which you see in organic inorganic chemistry textbooks then the occupied-occupied part would not be diagonal. But this part, the occupied virtual part, that's always diagonal. If that's not diagonal, we haven't solved the Hartree-Fock equations. So this is zero, because we did Hartree-Fock. But of course, that's only zero if you're using proper Hartree-Fock orbitals. Otherwise, it's not. <coughs> 